Action. Okay, so we are now recording. Um, right, now that one, today's one of my meditation session is over, Martine is joining us. Um, Martine is from her home in France by Zoom to speak about having a regular meditation practice, one which has a focus on creative awareness. So Martine was born in France in 1953 and ordained as a Buddhist nun in Korea in 1975, studying Son Buddhism for nine years at the Songwang Sa Monastery under the guidance of the late, late master Kusan Sunim. Uh, you speak French, English and Korean, and you can read Chinese characters. And Martin, you've written many books. The most recent, I believe, is The Spirit of the Buddha. You've also written various articles for magazines on the Korean way of Zen, sorry, the Korean way of tea, Buddhism and women, Buddhism and ecology, and Zen cookery. So Martine is interested in daily life, meditation in daily life, Buddhism and social action, religion and social women's issues, and Zen, its history and mythology. So as well as teaching meditation retreats and workshops on your own, with, with your husband Stephen, you also co-lead retreats worldwide, including here in New Zealand from time to time. That was a while ago. Um, and we're now crossing over to you at your home in France, Southwest France. So, Martin, welcome to Wellington, and over to you. Thank you. So, hello, everybody. So, uh, you wanted me uh, to talk about um, regular practice and creative awareness. I think what we have to see is that when we talk about practice, can you hear me well? Yes. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about re regular practice, in a way, it's nearly what do we mean? Do we mean that every day we take meditation and we do a certain exercise? Does it mean that we have the intention to cultivate meditation as we go about our day? And then the question is, what does it mean to cultivate meditation? So what I'd like to come back to a little bit is looking at first, what do we do when we practice? And what does it do with creative awareness? So when we practice meditation, whatever type of uh, meditation we do, we try to put together Anchoring, focusing, concentrating, and looking, questioning, inquiring. And so the first one, the focusing, like focusing on the breath, or on the sound, or on a question, on a quality, will help us to become more calm and spacious. And then the questioning, the looking deeply, will help us to be more clear and open. And so in a way, I would say that by cultivating, anchoring, and questioning, you develop calmness and clarity, and that become creative awareness. So in a way, when we sit in meditation, we're not just in a way watching the breath, or we're not just body scanning, or we're not just focusing on love and kindness we're actually fundamentally developing qualities we already have, but to a higher degree. All of us can concentrate, all of us can question, but we try to do it in a more specific way so that it develops more. And then these two things together, calmness and clarity, are going to become this creative and then the creative awareness, I would say, has two aspects. One is acceptance. The creative awareness is going to help us to see clearly what is going on. What is going on inside, what is going on outside. So at that level, the acceptance is clearly, for example, our good qualities. And so seeing that clearly, then we can develop more and we can have more confidence in them. 
we can also observe and see clearly what is difficult in humans. We have certain habits who can be harmful to ourselves, to others. But the questioning helps us to see that although we have these habits, they are not the same all the time, and we're not always like that. So then with the harmful habits, we can see certain conditions give rise to them. And then with creative awareness, we can create engage with the habits and see what way can I help myself within that? How can I accept that I have certain limits? And at certain times, I will react a certain way. How can I minimize that? And the creative awareness, so you have acceptance, but you also have transformation. And transformation is very much through this creative awareness, again, seeing clearly what's going on. And in a way, see what is it that can transform and what is it I cannot. And that's why the acceptance and the transformation go together within the creative awareness. And so in terms of the regular practice, of course, you can practice every day. But then the question would be first, which posture? Do I sit every day? But I can also do walking meditation. I can also do lying down meditation. I can also do standing meditation. So I think in terms of regular practice, we have to be careful of the posture. Then in terms of the time, some people might have lots of time, some people have little time. And then often people, to me, this, if you want to practice regularly, sit or walk or stand or lie down at all, that's wonderful. But that's not just practice. Regular practice would be, in a way, to bring that mindfulness in everyday life. And then you can bring it in a different way. You can bring it as a general awareness, or you can bring it as a specific awareness. This is also something we can play with. Like if we are driving, you can actually practice. That's something I do a lot when I... Uh, drive somewhere, I generally try to meditate at the same time. Because what I notice is that as I drive, generally often I think of something else, which personally I think is a little dangerous. So it because my practice really come back to driving. And then when you drive, what you want to have is a more generalized awareness of the whole thing. And then at other times, uh, it might be useful to just be aware of one thing. Being aware of listening, being aware of speaking, or for example, if you are in the queue in the supermarket, instead of getting a little frustrated, you can just stand. And then you do standing meditation. And then you might just be aware of your breath, or you just might be aware of your body standing there. Or you could bring the creative awareness to listen to somebody. You could bring the creative awareness to working. And then ask the question, how do I work? Do I work in such a way that I barely start, that I'm ready to the next task? So while I'm doing the first one, I'm thinking of the second one. When I get to the second one, I think of the third one. And then it can be really interesting to check. When I work, I can stay more with what I do right now. And then when the time is finished, can I leave there? And then move to the next one, and so on and so forth. Or we can bring the creative awareness in relationship. How do we relate to someone? Do I relate to the person as I encounter them now? Or do I meet them as they were a month ago? Do I meet the person right now for themselves? 
or do I meet them with that idea of how they were a month ago? This is also something I think of creative awareness can help us is, do we meet the world, of course from ourselves, because we are ourselves, but can we deem a little bit the self-centeredness and meet other for themselves? And I think this is kind of an interesting practice. When you meet somebody, I might meet the person more for myself or more for them. So this is what I wanted uh, to start with. And then I thought maybe we could have some questions and then I could elaborate on whatever interests you. So you're throwing it open to questions now? Yes, yes. Yeah. How much time have we got? I don't know how much time we have. Well, you've only taken seven minutes so far, and we are, I'd say we've got at least, at least another 23, if not more, if you need it. All right. So but I, think I would like some questions to see what people are interested in. Go on, say that. Go on, say that. Oh, I haven't got a question yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, sort of thinking, I'm still thinking about words. I thought I saw you. Uh, just, just a really simple one. Oh, should I go? Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, I can hear you well. Oh, can you? Um, I'm here now, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this creative awareness, um, I'm not actually sure what it is. Can you, can you elaborate more as to what it actually is? Okay, okay, sure. So, uh, often, in a way, when we talk about meditation, uh, we talk about mindfulness. So, or you talk about awareness. You have these two words which are relatively synonymous. And so, what we have to see is that we are not trying to create something that is there, because you have mindfulness, you have awareness, and it comes from the fact that we are conscious, all of us, we human in our brain and our body function, then we are conscious. Uh, we can be barely conscious, like sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're like barely conscious, or you can be very conscious as when you're very obsessed about something and you cannot think of anything else. So we take this ability we have to be conscious. And through the meditation, we're going to develop it more. But it's not just being conscious as if I become a radar, so I'm aware of everything. But it's becoming conscious as in bringing a clear and clear attitude to what's going on, inside and outside. And then we bring friendly awareness to the, to, to the practice itself. So that's the difficulty with the awareness is that it's what you cultivate, it's a result of the cultivation, and it's what you use to cultivate it. So in a way it covers it. Because in a way you have to be conscious to be mindful. Then we cultivate mindfulness so far that we cultivate a friendly, caring mindfulness. So a certain type of mindfulness and cultivating mindfulness actually makes us mindful in a creative way. So let me explain how the meditation works. So let's say you are aware of the breath. When you're aware of the breath, basically what you do is that time to time you're aware of the breath and time to time, most of the time, you fall back to the breath, to be aware of the breath. So, when you do that, that's the way the anchoring and the focusing were, is that when you do that, four things happen. One thing is that you don't continue to feed your mental habits, you dissolve your power, and you bring them back to their creative function. I see one of the, the meditation with the entry is to help you to bring the mental habits to their creative function. 
So we have a, if you sit in meditation, you might have noticed generally your thoughts are not very creative or original. Generally, what you think is something you have thought before. So it's fairly repetitive. And you can notice planning, repeating, criticizing, judging, counting, etc. And so the meditation is going to bring this habitual tendency to plan. Because if you notice, you don't just plan one time or two times, you plan a hundred times. Or you ruminate a hundred times. Or you judge a hundred times. But here, Judge a bit, and you come back to the breath. You plan a bit, and you come back to the breath. And then over time, the habit goes down and comes back more to its creative functioning of planning when I want to plan, judging when it's useful, reflecting when it's useful, imagining when it's useful. And then the function is going to be much more creative. Then the other aspect, so that here already you can see the awareness is just the fact that we are aware, but that it had been a lot more. And because it's not so repetitive, then it has more possibility to be creative. Then the second aspect of the meditation is the inquiry, the looking deeply, the quaking. And one of the things you ask to do is to be aware of change. And when you're aware of change, it counteracts the tendency we have to make things permanent. It's always like this. You will never change. I mean, sometimes we have the feeling that the same feeling makes the same mistake. And then here with the change, it's really that although we might repeat something, it's not all the time there. It's not every second, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month. In time to time, something happens. And then you become interested in what are the conditions that makes it happen inside and outside. And again, because you're not fixing so much, I'm always like this. You're always like that. That's a very little place for creativity. And through that inquiry, that clarity, then the creative potential has more possibility. So the creative awareness is made up of the creative functioning, plus you could say the creative questioning. Which then, uh, with the meditation, you build up a feeling so that it can become activated in daily life. Does so that make sense? A lot more here. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I, I have a question that um, you may or may not be able to answer. But um, talking about uh, creative awareness, as you've explained it, I may not have understood it fully, but what comes to my mind is the, the notion of putting things particularly problems in the back of my mind and not consciously thinking about them and uh, over time a solution arises to this problem it is not a conscious process i just wonder how that would fit into any notion that you might have within that framework of creative awareness exactly you see this is what i mean by <coughs> acceptance and transformation that in a way you have a difficulty you have a choice to make and our tendency 
is to think a lot about it. But the more we think about it, generally the more we get stuck because we're actually repeating the same thing. But if we think a little bit about the difficulty and then we leave it aside, actually within us something is going to work. We can think a little again, a little later, just a little bit, and then we leave it. And then, as you said, <laughs> we find the solution, sometimes it just pops up. Yeah. And personally, that's the way when I used to write books, that's what I used to do. I used to just think a little bit about the theme, the idea, and then I used to leave it. And then I used to think a little about it again and leave it. And then when I came down to write, in the process of writing, all these would come together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. This is Ramsey here. You've just described my creative process in one. Name a problem, think about it, then go away. <laughs> go for a long walk, spend some time not thinking about it, and come back and boom. <laughs> Sometimes it can take weeks, though. Exactly. No, I think that's why I say to some people that in a way you have to have patience. Especially if it's a choice you have to make, because you're constantly thinking, should I do this, should I do that, should I do this, should I do that? And you know, when I start, that at one moment, one will know, and one has to wait for this moment. And then sometimes it takes time, but then sometimes you will wake up and you will know for sure. But the problem is, in a way, when you have, if I, interested in talking about choices should i say something about making choice mm -hmm. please yes, do please. okay so what is interesting with choices like should i leave my work or should i go on the street or should i do this should i do that but especially about our situation if the situation is fantastic you're not going to have a choice to make. You stay because it's fantastic. If the situation is really terrible, then hopefully you'll make a good choice of leaving the situation because it's too bad. But often, when it's difficult to make a choice, it's because that one day it's good, next day it's bad, next day it's good, next day it's bad. Then it's very hard to choose because one, more, one day we think, oh, it's fine. Next day you think it's terrible. <laughs> Next day it's fine. Then it's very hard to make a choice. And then in that kind of way, you have to, to wait a little bit. You have to think, then you have to do what they call meditative creative thinking. Is that like every day for 30 minutes you think about it. All the different things you can think about it, all the different things other people can think about it. And every time you try not to repeat yourself. But after searching, you leave it, as uh, Ramsey was saying. And then if you do this for a few days, at some point, you wake up and you know, now I'm going to do that. Any other questions, or are we going to? Or comments, or <laughs> observations? Okay, it's Philip again, Martin. Um, the other thing that you've, you've um, made clear, I think, is that a certain amount of time is required for people to do this thinking. And in the modern lifestyle, <laughs> increasingly people don't seem to make that time for this type of um, reflection or just general thinking, full stop, let alone creative awareness. <laughs> so I wonder if, if, if you could comment on, on the time factor 
in the modern lifestyle with regards to this? Well, you see, I'm not necessarily sure if the modern life as a time factor. I mean, there can be a time factor that we might want quick solution. But I would say generally, when we have to do a choice to make or when we are in a difficult situation, the time factor, I would say, is more personal. That if it's painful, we want it to go as fast as it can. And this is a little bit difficulty, is that if you have a difficult situation, in a way, I mean, if it's a dangerous one, of course, one has to leave the situation. But if it's not so clear, one wants a fast solution because it's painful. And I think then, in a way, that you could say one of the things that the mindfulness, the creative awareness can help us with is how can we deal with something that is painful? That is a little tricky. Because you see, if the thing is light, then the mindfulness can help us to be with it, asking the question, how long is this going to last? And if we don't grasp it, if we don't identify with it, and we just stay with it, generally it passes fast. If it's like a feeling, a sensation, and we can see, oh, how long is this feeling going to last? How long is this pain going to last? And if it lasts a few minutes, then generally, oh, now it's gone. If it's habitual, then we can do a little bit of reflection to notice when does it happen. It doesn't happen all the time. So then to kind of bring the awareness to the condition. Does it happen when I'm tired? Does it happen when I'm stressed? Does it happen when I'm not slept well? Uh, does it happen because I am afraid of something? Uh, does it happen because I am confused in certain situations? And so in a way, to kind of see I am not like that all the time, but time to time, it happens. And then trying to understand it, trying to creatively engage with it. So that, will wa that one will require a little more time. Then the next one, the next level is when you are in a really difficult situation and when it's very intense and because of the intensity you think it's going to last a long time. And the problem we have is that then we, we can't stand it and at the same time we cannot stop obsessing about it. This is very tricky. And so here, in a way, we have to realize that thinking generally won't help us there. With the second one, thinking really can help us. With this one, if something is very intense, then in a way you have to accept it's intense. At some point, it will pass. Thinking about it right now might not help because it will amplify it. And that's why then, the coming back actually to the anchor, for example, the breath or the body or sounds or the loving kindness phrases can help us then more to create space. So I would say reflection is more useful for the second case. The first case I would say just being aware in the moment in the experience is more useful. And for the third case, I would say then trying to find an anchor which can release some of the intensity, they would be more helpful. So I think it depends on the situation. M Martin, I have a question for you. Uh, it's, it's about obsessive thoughts which probably have no basis in reality. Have you got a how would you help someone who um, to discern whether 
an obsessive thought is real, has a basis in reality or, or not? Well, the problem here is that from your point of view, that it might not have basis in reality, but the question is why do they have this obsessive thought? And if, if they have OCD, in a way, like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, it has a basis in their brain. So in a way, uh, first you have to say, yes, maybe something happened to them, so it has a basis in reality, or maybe they are oversensitive, they are much more sensitive than you, so you would not be obsessed about it, but because they can very kind of their system as high enough that for them there is a basis because they feel something, even if for other people the reaction might be why they're reacting so much to this. And then the thing would be because maybe they have had some genetic experience in the past, which other people would not have. Or, in a way, it's like a case of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is that in the brain there is activation, and that activation gives them the impression that something is dangerous, even if there is nothing dangerous. So in a way, it has a basis, but not like a basis with evidence. So personally, what I would look at is if the person is obsessive and if they are often, the thing would be what about, what are they obsessed about? What seems to trigger them? And then what I would, personally I would not question the reality of it but I would try to help them to find some way to, to, to diminish the intensity. So not necessarily addressing the obsession, because it's not obvious to you, but obvious to them. But could you make them feel less stress, more calm, in a friendly way, and then the obsession would diminish Thank you. Martine, listening to you talk about OCD, I was wondering um, what you would say uh, or how you would suggest working with somebody with um, suffering from anxiety or from extreme anxiety. Okay, uh, somebody who has extreme anxiety, uh, either they have had traumatic experience in the past, which make their nervous system uh, more easily triggered, or for biological reason, they're much more sensitive. So that's that's certain. So then, but with people who are very anxious, generally they're very easy to trigger. Generally, their nervous system goes up very fast. And so generally I would try again to find some way to, to calm, to see if there is an activity which brings the thing down. And uh, there is a wonderful book about the OCD uh, by somebody who, who do meditation. And one of the fellows, one way to for him uh, to calm down was to do embroidery. Just doing embroidery, focusing on something else, would help him. Somebody else gardening. You see, the thing you want, somebody who is anxious, you have to see, are they anxious because of their nervous system is up? Are they anxious because they are limited? Because one is more physical and one is more mental. So with the physical one, you don't want them to focus on their body. They're already too aware of their body. And so you really want them to focus on nature, on sound, on something outside of themselves. For people who are 
too much in their soul, then it's kind of like you are basically to distract them from their thought. Or you have to reassure them. I mean, you have to see the way they work. Or you have to make them more aware of their body if their body is not painful. Or you have, uh, you have to see basically what helps to calm down. Because in both cases, it's kind of an easier intensity in thought. Because, you know, like you have people who say, but what if, what if, what if? And it's kind of, in a way, bringing them to now. What is it that could, with the body, you need to calm it down because otherwise you feel jittery and you have to calm down the body in some way. With the mental, it's more to find a way, a friendly, clear way that right now they say. So in a way, it's kind of how can they feel safe so that they're not triggered in soul. So then it kind of depends on their tendencies. Mm. Thank you. Yes, that's very helpful. Yeah, right. Anybody else got a question? No. Uh, yeah, I um, with this with this creative awareness, how do we develop this in meditation? Because I can see I can see there's one way of meditating where it's quite repetitive and there's no um, there's no creative awareness, and I can see other times when I meditate and interest. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on how to develop this quality. So I would say that when you meditate, naturally the quality will be developed. So you don't have to do anything special to develop it. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to do is to, to develop the anchoring develop the question and doing that will develop the creative awareness so personally i see it as a effect of the meditation so for me what you're saying martin is that the more you actually meditate on a regular basis the more you will become creatively aware of what you're doing is that right yes yeah right. yeah because I, I think in a way the meditation is to develop the muscles of creative awareness. So at the beginning, we are aware, but we see that we are not very creative because we still very much in the repetition of baptism. And then over time, we see more and more the creative awareness. So at the beginning, it's more like just awareness. And then you're more like in the say the acceptance, seeing the repetition. But then over time you start to see the transformation. And then you see there can be more creativity because there are less repetition. I think the two go together. Lovely, thank you. Uh, Martin, we, we, this is with 35 wonderful minutes. Thank you very much. And we'll say um, from Wellington in New Zealand, we'll say good night. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. we hope you have a wonderful day. And Wednesday is an excellent day for you in France. Bon New Year's. Yeah. Bon journée. Du tu. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.